please welcome Rick Porter from Discover the Stage. Hey, so how's it going, everybody? Uh, I'm Rick Porter. I'm running Discover. I'm one of the co-founders. I am the CEO and founder, too. Uh, we believe crypto um, and social. So the intersection of crypto and social is Discover. We're trying to bridge that gap between crypto and social through our current platform. And this is a place where people can go and interact with different types of tokens, especially NFTs and fungible tokens. We have token tipping, NFT gated communities, and uh, all sorts of different ways to interact with these tokens. Um, and so here are some of the high levels. We have airdrops, NFT profile picks, fungible tipping, and NFT gating. NFT gating is most likely one of our most used features. So it's very common that someone actually comes to us and says, hey, I have a new NFT collection. I want to get it on the platform as quick as possible. How do I set up a gate? And gating has become such a requested feature that we now have like trait gates or specific types of uh, token IDs will get specific types of roles. Fungible tipping, you know, that kind of had a weird start. I think we started off with like, was it ghost token was the first tip, uh, to tippable token? And like it instantly it was a lot of fun, but it was like a dust, let's be real. It ended up being dust, but it was still fun. It was like a super like, right? Like really the value was is I'm so excited about this. I want to transfer a little bit of value more than an upvote. And then we started adding ICRC token tipping. ICRC token tipping I think is going to be something that we see progress a lot further than what it is. Like right now it's, yeah, it's cool, you know, you tip the token, but I think there's a lot deeper game that we haven't even explored with tipping and more ways to transfer value. NFT profile picks, you know, we did the verification uh, and that was kind of just like random. You know, we're just like, you know, it would be interesting we just put a gold circle around it and we could confirm that they actually owned it. It is probably one of the more difficult features out of all of these to actually maintain, especially with gating, because you have to have the actual token uh, with inside of the canister. So the canister has to be aware of the registries of all the NFT collections. So our, our canisters have uh, a duplicate of all the registries of all the NFT collections. And I think we're at like 700 or 800 different NFTs on the IC right now and Discover monitors all 800 or 700 of them. And the exchanges have been great. You know, working with EXT has been incredibly easy, especially through Entrepo. And so if you are launching a collection, usually it's the easiest for us if it's an EXT token. And obviously, uh, we're known for the airdrops. I don't even know how many airdrops we've had so far. There's probably been like 30 or 40 of them uh, just in the last like six or seven months. Uh, and people are always like, why didn't I get this? And honestly, it's, you just got to be active. You've got to be participating in the site. Got to be making sure you're having quality conversations. Ranking for us is super important. Understanding how the, how the user is producing quality content for the platform. Uh, tokenized communities, this is something that we're starting to get really close to. Um, we really want to inspire people to create a community and form a DAO around it and allow them to develop a token that is earned through that community. And our original architecture, we were like, oh man, we, uh, like we have to make so many modifications to the canister. Does the canister have to be owned by the portal or does the user own the canister? How does the token work? And we finally took a step back and realized we have to present a new concept of how we think about developing applications for the internet computer. And again, like all these things are possible because of the internet computer. Like you don't have to sign a transaction to upvote. You don't have to sign a transaction to comment, but everything is, these are, are, you have to sign these transactions, but you don't have to click a button, right? You don't have to load up MetaMask and confirm this transaction. Things just happen. And to us, that has created that paradigm where the user definitely feels like they're using that, that Web2 application. But token going back to it, token-based roles uh, and giving that financial power to the community themselves. To us, we think that's going to be a really challenging moment to, to make that shift. But I think as community members are developing the tools, and I think I've already talked to a couple people here who are creating the DAO technology, to me, the ideal scenario would be that we can simply plug into that existing infrastructure that people are setting up and allow those communities to leverage that same DAO, 
through the portal itself and allow all the, the proposals and portal management and down management happen through that portal itself. Um, this is something that's it's going to be interesting. Uh, we want this idea of putting like a smart contract in a post. So you have, you've developed a canister on the IC, uh, uh, and let's say it's a simple swap, right? You want to swap tokens. Wouldn't it be more interesting if you could you know, embed that into a post, an application into a post? And we experimented this with this very early on with a game called Portal Hunt. And people had to answer. We presented a puzzle, and uh, people had to like solve the puzzle and, and put something into, uh, into a form on a post. But well, we were like, that form should be an app, and anyone should be able to do that. So they should be able to come to Discover, uh, like the platform, leverage the distribution of the platform, and actually embed these kind of apps into the post. So we've been, we're very close to getting the MVP out, but I do think it's going to be a while before we actually figure out what is the exact protocol that we want to create to actually leverage the ability, allow people to leverage the ability to put apps with inside posts. So there's a lot of development happening, especially with what we saw with Plug uh, in their conversation earlier of like, how are they going to get apps with inside of Plug? And I think we're, we're asking a similar question. What kind of apps do people want to put into posts? And as you can imagine, it is a social platform. So I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be some pretty uh, crazy apps that people build and want to embed. Uh, so we have to buckle up for that one. Um, and the social fabric API is something that's getting also very close. We want the discover.js or the uh, open up our interface and allow anybody to start building applications on top of our current social graph. But like, we had to take a huge step back at the beginning of this year and like, how do we offer a social graph that anybody can query and anyone can build on top of? And we think that's going to be uh, a pretty big lift that's about to be revealed very, very soon. And of course, the Discover Arcade. We've been working with a couple gaming companies uh, who are building applications on the IC, like Fayfolk, and figuring out different ways that we can build their application, like help them build an application that fits with inside of the Discover Arcade. And that could be as simple as you know your profile that is on Fayfolk and all the characters that you've built up somehow are embedded into the portal that you're using for Fayfolk or you're using for that game to uh, kind of have that seamless experience between, okay, here's the arcade and here's the user. Uh, we're expecting to see something like that in the next couple weeks. Uh, and there's a lot more. There's, there's guilds. Like, wouldn't it be great if you could actually use the portal technology to establish a guild? And like, abstractly, Discover has all these really primitive social components, right? You have portals, which have content, which these contents have comments. And really, it's just content is posts and comments, right? So you end up with this hierarchy. So how do we further uh, develop out that hierarchy? And we have a developer who likes to think of everything as a folder. And so it's like, if we were to put folders with inside of folders, what would that look like? And then what kind of roles are required to access this? So we have full role-based access control in Discover, which gives you that ability to have really granular control on permissions with inside of these communities. So we're trying to work with those primitives to develop some of these components here to make it so that users can start developing applications with inside of Discover. So this next part is a little spicy, but it's like, one of the f issues that we've been looking at with Discover was how do we scale to hundreds, you know, millions of users and hopefully hundreds of millions of users while providing the same experience? And we realized that we needed to do a lot of things that would allow us to compete with Web 2 applications while still remaining a Web 3 application and still remaining, uh, still using the IC, so you still, still using the Internet Computers technology. And we were like, we need composite queries, custom transformations, you know, edge services, uh, unlimited instructions, unlimited payload size. I did caveat that with what is scientifically currently possible. Um, I do know that's been thrown around quite a bit. Uh, Multi-canister, multi-subnet queries within 50 milliseconds. So if I have data across multiple canisters, across multiple subnets, how do I quickly query that into a, and retrieve it retrieve it from all the canisters, verify the data, and display it to the users within 50 milliseconds, which would be the expectations. And canister mirror state validation. So how do we mirror the state with inside of our edge network onto the canisters? And so we call this the Discover Edge. And the Discover Edge, uh, some architecture right here, 
And so we have our canister one and two on the internet computer. We're able to mirror those canisters, validate the state of those canisters, and deploy them directly to our edge. And the edge works as an ingress and egress. So instead, typically you have your HTTP agent, you might point it to icp0.app. Here you just point it to edge.discover.one. And this will handle all the necessary components to validate the message by verifying the signature and passing it through the edge network and onto the IC. Note that the edge network is read only, so you're not like writing data to the edge network, you're writing data directly to the IC. Canisters are still completely accessible um, from, uh, from the internet. So it's like this is not some sort of barrier to entry. If people want to uh, directly connect to our canisters, they can still. But this just allows us to do certain things uh, which I'm going to talk about right now. And this to us is this enterprise grade Web3 social, right? So high level, we need news feed. News feeds are high level, like abstractly a feed is a search engine, right? It's displaying results relative to your historical interactions. So this is the technology that's help us going to do this. We're going to be able to leverage things like our social graph, uh, our asset graph, and uh, possibly use robust feed algorithms to actually display uh, relative content to the users themselves. And so this is hopefully going to help us scale with our users. Because one of the problems that we face is, you know, combating bots and things like that on networks is whack-a-mole. You know, you ban one bot, you're probably creating two or three more. But in reality, bots have a specific way of interacting with users. And you know, if you look at someone's social graph and you really put it up there and you look at it, the bots actually have no real impact to that user. They're, they're, they're a nuisance for sure, but their ability to manipulate feeds actually doesn't matter if you take into account the value of someone's feed relative to their social graph. So this is another reason why we need to build this technology is we need to be able to access robust feed algorithms to do that. Intelligent notifications, right? Like a notification isn't just like, hey, you got a message, let's get it. You got to start like grouping notifications. You got to time notifications. You got to figure out, you know, when, uh, what is their time zone so they're not like getting notifications at two or three in the morning. They're getting them through their day, right? How do you actually build uh, email retention, right? Like how do you retarget? That's kind of one of the problems with Discover that we have right now is how do we retarget our users? Anyone who comes to Discover right now, like literally has memorized the domain or they see us on Twitter. Given our growth and our current ret uh, retention, it's almost absurd to think about where we're at without any kind of these mechanics in place, right? So that means that like, users actually want to seek out Discover, they want to seek out the feed, and they want to seek out uh, the community that's there. So we want to give Discover that real opportunity with really intelligent notifications. Messaging, um, like how do people live communicate, right? Like, like we talked to OpenChat about possibly bet uh, embedding open chat into Discover. That's definitely a possibility. There's other messaging apps that we've been talking to too that want to embed the ability to have kind of like that troll box or that live messaging with inside of Discover to kind of create that communication. But we think we can also leverage, leverage our edge network to do things like that. Still writing everything to chain, right? Uh, partnership integrations. Like, you know, we had uh, some influencers speaking earlier, Blockchain Boy, right? And the amount of partnership integrations that they benefit from, from using things like TikTok or YouTube and those kind of programs that are in place that actually help with distribution with influencers is something that Discover needs to also. I have a whole theory on influencers, um, but like to me, Discover has to create its own influencers for it to be successful and independent. You know, when working with influencers, how do you move their audience, right? Well, how do you develop an audience? So we need to build the right tools on Discover for an influencer to actually build out and retarget their own audience. And make it portable too. Like how do you actually develop a portable audience that they can build on Discover and possibly move to other platforms? And again, live communication. Um, we have live, something like Live Spaces that Twitter uses rolling out relatively soon. We've actually been using it for our Discover like internal communication. So we have like this weekly meeting and we all jump in there and make up fake usernames and try to guess who each other are and things like that. But uh, we think that Live Spaces will be in one of those features that allows the users to kind of really break down those barriers and have more of, uh, develop out an audience, but also work with the community closely. Um, and long-term, we're really focused on this open social FI API. 
So it's like right now we're on Discover. Um, and we have like all the wallet integrations, the feed algorithms, the stores, the posts, the profiles, and the feeds. But how do we actually make it so if you want to develop your own Discover, how do you leverage our current API? And going back to the edge, we really think that's going to be possible. We think that now we'll be able to develop these really robust algorithms that anyone can tweak. Like these algorithms, this, the new technology that's going to power them, anybody can go in there and be like, you know what? I do like the way that Discover is doing this algorithm, but I prefer a TikTok style algorithm. You know, more of a for you, where my I only find my followers on my follow feed, but my for you is really for discovery, right? And those are just graph search algorithms, right? With an highly enriched data. Like TikTok's got like super enriched data. But how do we do that in a healthy way? And we want to expose all these same tools to people that actually want to build some sort of new ecosystem app on top of Discover. Um, Multi-chain. Multi-chain's been super important to us. Uh, we've been working closely with Tonic's team and understanding where they're going with BTC ordinals. Um, NFT gating. Uh, and verified PFPs. We've been working with various APIs to actually allow you to, you know, pair your wallet with a MetaMask or pair your wallet with other types of wallet providers to bring in your Arbitron wallet, your Polygon wallet, your Ethereum wallet, or your Optimus pro uh, uh, wallet, and actually bring those onto Discover, pair them, and allow the users to actually create gated communities abstractly around all these different types of NFTs and collections, and also have verified PFPs. And we're probably looking at launching that relatively soon, as soon as we get this architecture out. And by the way, the Edge service right now is completely running. If you go to discover.one right now, you load up the feed. The feed is actually rendering right from the Edge. And uh, you'll feel that response time. But going back to this, we have the ability now to start providing this kind of gating for the users, right? We'll be able to bring in things like um, Snapshot, and they'll be able to abstractly have information about their DAO and their proposals on their snapshot.org account, from their snapshot.org setup onto Discover with inside of a portal. And we're definitely looking at other chains. I think given the fact that, you know, you have Bitfinity who's very close to their EVM integration, and we think this is a good opportunity for us to kind of meet them in the middle to provide the kind of gating technology that these communities might actually need. Uh, of course, here's the founders, me, Juan, and Alex. We have various backgrounds, but we've come together. We've been working together for, wow, I think like four years now. Uh, I've known Alex for like six or seven, but it's been quite the journey. I, I don't think some of the things that we were thinking when we first started of how, how robust and how different things would be at this point in time, but it's been definitely an interesting journey. Uh, and of course, here's who's invested into us. We have Polychain Upfront, BDMI, Tomahawk, thank you very much. Shima and Firefly, also thank you very much. So yeah, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> anyone? Love you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so straight up, when we built Edge, the intention was to solve a very specific problem that we were facing. And we were like, every time we came up to an issue when developing the Edge, and it took about six months to actually build this. It wasn't something we like baked overnight. It was an incredible amount of thought. And I will thank Definity deeply for all the help they gave us in building it also. A very informative uh, and some of the technology they helped us repackage to make it possible to do that. Um, we should talk. You know, the edge requires full transaction logs, right? The idea is, is our, all of our canisters now create transaction logs, right? And we actually read all those transaction logs back into the edge to replay them to actually create the same state that's in our canister that's with inside of our edge. And, Obviously, anybody who's built a relational database in their lifetime or understand how they work, uh, log shipping is how basically it works. So we'll be able to uh, deploy the edge or you know, globally as long as we're able to replay all these transactions. Uh, but we would love to talk to any team interested in leveraging the edge technology so we can figure out how it can fit and cater towards your needs also. Good question. Thank you. Hi, Rick. You Yo. mentioned uh, the open social API things. Like, how do you give the guarantee or the 
the comfort for people to build on top of these APIs that over time it's not going to change? Um, <laughs> you know, that's probably why we haven't opened up our API yet. Uh, like, as soon, like, I've built SaaS most of my career, uh, software as a service, anyone? And it's a painful process if you're not dogfooding it. If you're not the first customer, you're going to learn that your first customer hates every choice that you've ever made. And for us, we feel like we've come to more of a concrete schema, and it's getting closer that these primitives haven't changed. Some of these primitives uh, for our API haven't changed in a year. Um, so we're getting better to making, we're getting, I was gonna say gooder, but we're getting better at making good decisions. Uh, but the schema will change. Uh, we will have a three-month timeline or something like that saying, here will be the new version. Like, we have to improve. Like, we can't, uh, our old mistakes can't own us. Maybe just to follow up, if there's someone more successful who is graphed up, how does the comfort... Oh, you mean like the Facebook uh, open graph situation with Zynga? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we've got to decentralize the project. You know, we've got to open it up and allow anybody to own that schema. You know, it, we've got to allow people to control it, right? And the users and the token holders to control it. And that way they can guarantee that the trust is within inside of the protocol itself. And I think the, we have to figure out a healthy approach to that. Like, just, I believe, definitely believe decentralized social and Web3 social have an uh, amazing future. But I think, as we were talking about before, how do you protect the users, right? How do you protect somebody, a 13 or 14 year old who's online and makes a mistake? And how do you make that mistake not permanent part of their entire history? And yeah, there's obviously people out there who we need to make sure that they are accountable for what they say online, but I don't believe everyone needs the accountability. I think a lot of us have the right to be forgotten and especially some people like that. So, Huge questions to answer, uh, and ask and answer, but very good question. Thank you. Hey, Rick. I'm over here in the oh. middle. <laughs> it's like super bright, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, as, this, the Discover platform is, is largely uh, UI, ex user experience-based, kind of like Reddit, right? Uh, in, in your speech, you talked about uh, how to bring influencers onto the Discover platform, which is a completely different paradigm, uh, creating a uh, application or, 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 an e or a community versus a brand around me. Right. How, how do you, what are your plans on empowering influencers? Uh, and, and are you going to change the user experience or? or yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know if it's on or not. Doug might know, self-posting, no, okay, no. Uh, self-posting is coming out. Uh, it's probably, let's say a week, two weeks away. Um, it's already been programmed, it's just really waiting for its release. But we think that communities are great, right? But like, we need to make sh allow someone to build that individual brand, right? And there's an incredible amount of work on our side to help you and people building their own brands with distribution and like working with the community and followers that you've built. But self-posting is something that's coming out relatively soon. And, and then the, the user experience between you know, picture content, uh, text-based content, and video content is completely different as well. So how, how do you plan on uh, distributing that kind of uh, data in a, in a nice way that users can, can view? Yeah, I think um, our current feed is something that needs to, we need to revisit. Like, how are we actually, like, who is the target audience and how are they being catered towards, right? And are they long form or short form content? And if they're long form or short form, is it what type of video, right? Um, I think that more exploration needs to happen with that. It's kind of interesting because it's like, if we try to isolate one, we are orphaning certain parts of our community. The long form content uh, community has its own niche with inside of Discover. So I think we've got to figure out what is a better way of doing that. Um, we also have one more interesting tidbit to that is like with our new feed algorithms, it'll probably reveal the type of user, which we would love to help see how we can make that data public, but reveal the type of user, which, what type of content they consume. 
right? Like we, we try to have no opinion on these things where it's like develop whatever content you want, right? But that doesn't help people build communities because they need to target a specific type of content for the audience that is consuming it. And I think we've got to figure out how do we give that granular control, not only to the people who are like building a brand, but also to the users themselves. Hi, Rick. This is Thomas from Canastore. Great presentation. I just had a quick question about what your statement was about protecting the user. Um, the only way to really t protect the user is technically the, the, the legislation and, and regulations and compliance is going to be behind the technology. So do you think it's possible to have like a marriage with regulators that you codify their re uh, regulations and legislation to protect consumer protection laws and things into the code. And maybe that would protect data subjects through them owning the data and the principal ID of the canister. Is that something that could be possible? Yeah, I, like I agree. Um, I think it's a deeper question than, I do think it's a bigger question than that. And it's like, I think we can do better than what legislators can actually do is what, my high level point is I think there's more ways that we can protect the user when we don't necessarily, that could be beyond those rules or, or those laws. And it's like user protection and safety is very important to us. Uh, we've, we've been around enough to see situations where things can go wrong and it's been a very revealing moment for us, humbling moment too. So we think about these things a lot, but yeah. And it, it was mostly in commentary to permanent history, right? Immutable history of like, someone's transaction logs. And like you, when you talk about law, I think about uh, the right to be forgotten, right? Uh, how do we allow someone to be forgotten in an immutable environment? Yeah. Questions, good? Yeah, awesome. Thank you guys. Rick Porter, everybody. Yeah, that was thank awesome. You. Thank you so much.